evening. This is Dr. Daria Brzezinski at WAAT 7.50 a.m. on your radio dial. We are here with Children Come First every Tuesday from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. This morning we have a distinguished visitor, Dr. James Prescott. Dr. Prescott received his degrees in Canada, New Mexico, Wisconsin. He is the currently the director of um, the Humanistic American Humanistic Association, and he's former NIH director of child development. Good morning, Dr. Prescott. Uh, good morning. We're going to talk to Dr. Prescott this morning about all of his work and looking here, Jim, uh, I've got a 15-page Vita here. You've done extensive work all over the country and all over the world for the last few years on developmental neuropsychology. Can you tell us a little bit about that, please? What is developmental neuropsychology? Well, basically it's a uh, very small um, um, discipline within the larger field of psychology in which we study uh, brain behavioral relationships. And, um, and the developmental neuropsychologist uh, examines how the early life uh, experiences affect the developing brain and then ultimately behavior. So we have a very clear um, focus uh, that if we are to understand behavior, we have to understand brain structure processes that underlie that behavior. And then we have to uh, ask the most important question of how the developing brain of an infant child is encoded and programmed for certain kinds of behaviors. Jim, you did, you did a 20-year, I believe, study with the National Institute of Health on violence, and we'd like to talk with you about that research. I know it was, your work has been uh, mentioned in books like Carl Sagan's book, Cosmos, uh, as a leading neuropsychologist, and many other books and references to your work. Could you tell us a little bit about your experiments and talk a little bit about uh, the surrogate monkey relationships and how that affects violence in our schools and with children? Yeah, um, let me begin that uh, before uh, joining the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, I was previously with the Office of Native Research as uh, assistant head of the Physiological Psychology Branch. And the NSHC was a new institute um, that was uh, formed uh, within the National of health, and I went there to develop uh, what I called uh, created the developmental uh, behavioral biology program, which is simply to look at the broad range of uh, brain behavioral influences, the relationships, and, and the effects of the early environment upon uh, brain behavioral development. And one of the uh, major problems that uh, I confronted was um, the studies that uh, Dr. Harry Harlow and his associates at uh, the, Delta, uh, at the um, Wisconsin Regional Primate Center. Uh, where they had separated the infant monkeys from the mothers at birth and reared them in, in single cages where they couldn't uh, uh, touch or be touched by other animals or human attendants. And these animals, um, as infants, became extremely depressed, withdrawn, uh, a variety of autistic like behaviors, uh, hyperactivity, hyper reactivity, uh, tactile voice behavior, also impaired pain perception. And then as juveniles, um, and they also engaged in types. Uh, stimulus seeking behaviors, uh, uh, toe sucking, and so forth. But then, as the Jim, older, you're going to have to talk to. Remember, our level of audience is not scientists, so you're going to oh, have to right, talk okay, in a little um, bit of English here. Right. Okay. And I'm just trying to give a description of the behavioral pathologies that do. So we they so they suck their toes. Right, and it's, and uh, to provide the sensory stimulation that they uh, were deprived of by being separated from the mothers, and so they engage in walking behaviors and head banging behaviors. And then as juveniles, they engage in self-mutilation and, uh, and pathological uh, violent behavior toward other animals. So, in, in other words, when they were young children, because they did not have the touching stimulation from the mother, they were devoid of that, what happened is they tried to do it in themselves, and when they became uh, adolescents, then they were literally self-inflicting rather than self-stimulating. That's right, and that's, that's common to uh, most mammals who are um, deprived of this kind of early sensory stimulation. And um, Mel Dog and Scott at McGill, where I got my degree in, in, in Canada, um, they raised puppies uh, in, in isolation, and they also developed these stereotypical behaviors and self-mutilation that would literally tear the flesh from their, from their uh, uh, 
legs, and, and that's what the, uh, the monkeys would do. So literally what you're telling us is that infants separated from mothers at early ages and not receiving the, the touch from the mother have a propensity of, uh, to be able, when they become, as they grow and as they become teenagers, to be self-destructive. Well, that is, that is correct, and, um, and it's not only touch, it's body movement, and that's, that's one of the, the great experimental breakthroughs that were made in the um, experimental animal studies with the monkeys, but that study was done by Dr. William Mason and, and Gershon Berkson, and they moved, uh, they reared infant monkeys, um, again, in a colony room, in single cages by themselves, but in one experimental group, the surrogate mother uh, was artificially moved and the other uh, surrogate mother was bolted to the floor. And let me describe the, the surrogate mother. It was simply a Clorox bottle wrapped with a fur rug and a pipe pan attached beneath it. And then they had a, a, a metal rod running down through the Clorox bo bottle, which was attached to a, a cam operated device, which provided movement uh, to the uh, surrogate mother. So the little monkey would ride on, on that little you know, surrogate mother. And then the other uh, group of monkeys, uh, singly caged, they, they were had no touch or uh, body contact with other animals. Uh, it was bolted to the floor and didn't move. And what resulted from that was very dramatic. Uh, the isolation reared monkey uh, that was reared on the moving mother surrogate did not develop all these uh, behavioral pathologies. So they grew up uh, not being depressed, not being socially withdrawn, not being hyperactive, reactive, uh, no pathological violence. There was some self-stimulation, but no self-mutilation. And, uh, but they were basically normal, socially inquisitive animals. And, and the only variable that distinguished between these two groups of animals was body movement. And, um, and that was a profound discovery, and that's what led me to um, consider the brain mechanisms that were involved in that particular sensory input and why it was so important. And, um, so the two studies were one on, on the touching, the infants who were able to be held and touched at early ages, and the second was body movement like rocking, is that correct? Well, uh, the, the earlier studies by the Harlows uh, involved a variety of different experimental conditions, but we were able to isolate that it was the sensory deprivation of touch before Dr. Mason and Bergson did the moving surrogate study, because they were all uh, reared with a stationary surrogate. They were not, not moved. That was the, the, the major change that uh, Dr. Mason made. And lo and behold, that one variable of movement um, essentially prevented the uh, uh, behavioral pathologies, what we call the maternal social deprivation syndrome, from developing. And then uh, re-examining that in terms of uh, uh, developmental processes, um, we can see that the primary sensory stimulation of the fetus in gestation during fetal development is movement, uh, with the mother moving around uh, throughout the day and so forth. And that's what led to my uh, cross-cultural studies, which we'll get to later, but um, the question that uh, came up was that no one had uh, conducted brain studies on these, these uh, isolation reared animals, these mother-deprived uh, animals. And that's what I initiated when I joined the NISHD with several other investigators, and lo and behold, we found the brain pathology. Um, and what did you discover was the correlation between the touching and the body movement in the brain? Well, what we found is that the isolation reared monkeys um, had uh, a brain pathology, that is, um, and uh, abnormal electrophysiological activity of brain cells. They had high voltage spike discharges and, and deep brain structures, particularly limbic structures, but also the cerebellum. And, um, and there was uh, a structural uh, deficit of brain cells, so that there was abnormal dendrites of brain cells. And, um, and, of course, this was uh, discovered back in the late 60s and early 70s. And, um, and then we also discovered uh, a study uh, initiated with uh, Dr. Coleman. We did plate and serotonin analysis uh, in the isolation of rear monkeys versus the normally rear. Now, it's serotonin is uh, something that we've heard in the in the mainstream these days. What is serotonin and how well, is that affected? Well, uh, this, this is where the... the a major uh, uh, importance really comes in here is that the sensory deprivation, the, the lack of uh, affectional bonding, 
uh, results in altered neurochemistry of brain cells as well as its like, physiological activity as well as its structural characteristics. And other studies uh, done by psychiatrists with, uh, with human uh, subjects who were uh, attempted suicide, committed homicide, uh, have been consistently found to have deficits of brain serotonin um, compared to uh, uh, subjects who, who uh, did not show those behaviors. So deficits of brain serotonin are directly uh, linked to uh, depression, um, it involves uh, discontrol and pathological violence, both S homicide and suicide. And now the critical parts of this uh, in terms of the studies of mother love, uh, what we're talking about, mother love deprivation, is um, that it does alter uh, this uh, brain serotonin system so that there are brain serotonin deficits. Um, these, these studies come from uh, uh, the animal studies, but we know because of, of uh, other studies that we can expect uh, uh, violence. Uh, uh, we have established that with the uh, uh, adult subjects who are pathologically violent to have and depressed to have uh, deficit brain serotonin. But the point that I have been uh, trying to emphasize is that it's the failure of mother love uh, to properly encode the uh, and develop the developing brain with uh, brain serotonin and other neurotransmitter substances. Uh, oh, here we go, blaming mothers again for all of our problems. Well, I know that was coming through, but it's really not blaming mother, it's really blaming... Well, what do you mean? So it's really blaming society for its failure to support mothers being nurturing mothers. Oh, well, that's a different story. Well, yeah, but I uh, just didn't have a chance to get to that point, but I'm glad you raised that point. And, uh, and so there's another uh, uh, critical issue here, too. It's not just the uh, sensory aspects of touch and body movement, but also the... Uh, nutrients in breast milk. Uh, in breast milk, there's a, there's a wide variety of, of course, uh, uh, of biochemical factors, very rich compared to inter-formula milk. Um, one critical element is uh, uh, tryptophan, which is the precursor amino acid for conversion into development of brain serotonin. This is absent in inter-formula milk. So we are affecting brain development uh, specifically in terms of the brain serotonin system by not breastfeeding. And so we are essentially producing uh, generation after generation of children who have brain deficits, uh, that's my prediction, of brain serotonin due to the failure of one overall nurturance uh, and physical affectional bonding, which includes breastfeeding. So we have two sources which um, contribute to the development of brain serotonin. And so it's not surprising to understand why there is uh, so much depression in, in uh, adolescents, the youth, and, and adulthood. It's one of uh, the most uh, frequent uh, uh, dominant mental, if we call it mental disorders um, in our culture today. There's something like one and a half million prescriptions of um, antidepressants to children and youth in our, our society this past year, particularly of the uh, what's called a serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which acts to increase the level of brain serotonin. So the question is, what are we doing wrong that all these children and youth have to have uh, uh, antidepressants? And and that's just one drug. You know, uh, we look take a look at Ritalin, and that's another medication for children and youth. So um, we really need to start paying attention as to our national social policies as to uh, supporting uh, mothers being, uh, and nurturing mothers, and that means being with their infants and children and not in institutionalized daycare. So we run up against some major social policies that uh, at the national level are very destructive. And, uh, and we're now, in my view, paying the high cost and penalty for that. Um, well, let me stop you for a second and remind our audience this is Children Come First, WAAT, 750 AM on your radio dial. We're here, this is Dr. Brzezinski, we are here every Tuesday from 10 to 11 AM. Children Come First is produced by EarthHeart Foundation, a nonprofit organization with offices in Pennsylvania, Virginia, and New Mexico. Children Come First is underwritten by CK Auto Parts Incorporated with stores in Music, Scranton, Pittston, and Kingston. 
You can visit them on our worldwide website at www.ceekayauto.com. We're here today with Dr. Jim Prescott, former director of the National Institute of Health and Children and Welfare. And Dr. Prescott is talking with us about the effects of our birthing practices and child rearing practices in America and how they affect the brain. And we were talking about tryptophan and serotonin a few minutes ago and how we have been giving children antidepressants. And what uh, Dr. Prescott has told us is it is in fact our practices, our child rearing practices for the first three to six years of life that is creating this tremendous amount of children who are on antidepressants like tryptophan. Uh, beta blockers, etc., and a rising level of serotonin. And I wanted to let's go back a minute. We were talking about let's take a few steps backwards here on your information about breastfeeding. There's another byproduct of breastfeeding as well, uh, which has to do with the immune system of children. Can you help us with a little on that? Well, yeah, that's uh, another uh, major factor. Uh, uh, for children, uh, children's immune system doesn't uh, fully mature until about five, six years of age. And breast milk is absolutely essential for the uh, first conferring the uh, antibody protections of the mother through the colostrum and, and uh, the first days of breastfeeding to the infant uh, for protection of you know, resistance, disease, and infection, and the like. But it's also essential for the development of the infant's own immune system. You know, and that takes a number of years to develop. So, by not uh, breastfeeding, um, uh, particularly for the duration of time that uh, uh, is recommended by the World Health Organization, which is two years and beyond. Um, the UNICEF and the American Association of Pediatrics also recommends that. Is that correct? Uh, they recommended uh, a year, and so, uh, but the World Health Organization, UNICEF, have been recommending uh, two years of age and beyond. Um, for over 10 years now. Um, so it's kind of surprising that the American Academy of Pediatrics would recommend only one year in the light of that, that other recommendation and in the fact that uh, if you take a look at primitive cultures, the breastfeeding uh, is, is uh, much beyond uh, uh, that two years. In fact, one, one report in Mother Magazine uh, indicates that uh, it's about 4.2 years or something like that. Um, so we well, it's not surprising in light of the fact that uh, companies that produce uh, canned milk and bottles and pacifiers and all that would much rather we buy their products than breastfeed our children. Well, that's absolutely right. And, and this has been fought for years and years and years by the uh, World Health Organization because it contributes to uh, early uh, death of many infants and children in third world countries. Uh, because they have no way of, uh, well, one, they're deprived of the essential nutrients that um, breast milk is designed for. Um, and then the, the infant formula milk um, is, cannot be properly maintained and prepared so that uh, the infants, um, you know, do not get proper nutrition, uh, you know, from the infant formula milk. Uh, a common practice is uh, um, for the mothers is to stretch the budget, and so they put water in with the infant formula milk, diluting it, and that furthers the, the uh, nutritional deprivation of the infant and child. Ironic enough, breastfeeding is free. Isn't it amazing? It is. It, it is. And uh, before I forget, let me just make one mention: is that my uh, position at the uh, National Institute of Child Health and Human Development was uh, uh, director of the Developmental Behavioral Biology Program, which is one of the many programs within ICHD. So uh, I'm not director of the overall institute, uh, but just uh, this uh, particular program. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that. Um, so anyway, back to the to the breastfeeding, we we are really in, in, a, in a very uh, critical situation, you know, uh, because of, of the, essentially the lack of breastfeeding in, in, in this country. And um, although there's uh, something like 62 percent of mothers initially begin breastfeeding, and that drops off to uh, at six months um, to about 25 percent, and then only about 14% of breastfeeding in one year. So you can see... Um, so what you're saying is that these, <clears throat> our practices in America have led our children to be deficient nutritionally because they don't, aren't breastfed, that they are 
in need of antidepressants when they get to be teenagers because they are not touched, because they don't aren't close to the body. So literally what you're telling us then is the daycare movement and the movement by companies, the bottle making companies, the formula companies, etc., are all selling us a bill of goods, is that correct? Well, uh, in a sense that is right. And we have to distinguish about daycare, uh, day daycare of children uh, five years of age and, and younger versus uh, 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 older. Uh, my concern is primarily uh, with children five years of age and younger. And we have no business of uh, uh, institutionalizing uh, daycare for uh, children under five years of age. Um, and without paying a, a high cost and penalty for that. And, could, um, can you tell us what some other countries have done with daycare? Well, Aren't you uh, telling me something about Sweden or Holland? Well, uh, their policies, uh, I don't have the specific data yet on, 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 these, on these countries, but uh, they have far more uh, liberal policies of maternal leave uh, and also paternal leave. Um, uh, but I unfortunately can't give you exact uh, uh, specifics on, on the policies of these uh, different nations. Um, all I know is that in, in this country it's, it's uh, very, very poor uh, that we have actual policies of enforcing the separation of mothers and infants uh, under the, the New Welfare Reform Act of 1996 that if the mother is to qualify for daycare uh, that she has to give up breastfeeding if she's breastfeeding and, and uh, put her uh, infant um, into uh, institutionalized daycare and hand over the, the care of her infant child to stranger care. And um, this is uh, emotionally uh, devastating for infants and children. And um, we have yet to, to examine the, really the long-term consequences of uh, this kind of uh, stranger care and, and the failure of breastfeeding compared to the group of children who are, are not uh, subjected to these uh, separation experiences and who have been breastfed for two years or longer. That's one of the studies that I've been trying to promote uh, um, for some years now. And um, Do we have any research on longitudinal studies with regards to children in daycare? I haven't seen anything. Oh, no. uh, in fact, uh, all the, the major, as that I can determine, uh, uh, national and collaborative projects, uh, longitudinal studies for 34 years, none of them bothered to even record whether uh, the mother breastfed or not, or or even how long. That uh, was considered that unimportant. And yet it's probably the, one of the single most important variables in early development to, to be uh, examined. Um, how fascinating. In addition to, you know, the, the, the extent to which uh, there are separation experiences. Um, Let's talk a little bit about your uh, research. Let's get back to your research again. We, uh, we're going to just talk a little bit about it because we'll be taking a break here at the bottom of the hour. Tell us about, you also did, not only you looked at the study of monkeys with Dr. Harlow, uh, primates in captivity, but you also studied other cultures. You studied 49 or 50 cultures, I believe, around the world? Uh, yeah, that, uh, one of the things that came, uh, you know, um, became very clear is that uh, it was unquestioned that uh, these monkeys who appeared under these kinds of sensory deprivation of separation of mother led to uh, abnormal brain development and function. Um, and the question is, was well, this really true for the human primate? And so that's what led me to uh, an examination of the exist existing database that other cultural anthropologists have collected uh, in their own studies. Um, unknown to, to each other. So basically what I did was um, to go to the human relations area files. And, and uh, at that time, this was back in, in the um, late 60s, Harvey Texter, a um, uh, cultural anthropologist, had compiled a huge statistical inventory of um, the findings from a variety of uh, cultural anthropologists um, throughout the world on, on uh, 400 culture samples of primitive or pre-industrial cultures. And what I was looking for is the critical variable, uh, which is identified from the Mason Bergen study, that is, uh, do you, does the mother carry the infant on, on its body throughout the day? That is even more important than breastfeeding. Uh, it's hard to 
believe that, but we have to understand that in the primitive cultures, uh, there is no option. You either breastfeed uh, the infant or the infant dies. Uh, and we get to the uh, some of the later studies that I did on, on uh, breastfeeding in primitive cultures, but uh, I selected uh, all the cultures in, in this 400 culture sample in which there was information available on whether the infant was carried on the, the body of the mother or caretaker throughout the day. And then compared it with uh, cultures in which there was uh, a rating of no infant carrying. And that yielded 49 uh, cultures. And it turned out, uh, then, of course, the, the other, uh, oh no, I should say that in addition to that, I needed uh, a measure of violence. And uh, so I took the most extreme measure of violence that was available in the human cultural uh, area file and this was my uh, slater on torture and, and killing and murdering and of the enemy captured warfare so when you combine those two variables it, I was able to find 49 cultures in which I could now compare uh, violence with the child rearing practice of uh, carrying the infant on the body of the mother and uh, those 49 cultures there was um, uh, 29 who were peaceful and, and 20 that were uh, violent Right. And it turned out that this one variable alone was so powerful that it could predict the violent and peaceful nature of 80% of the cultures. We'll be, we'll be coming back with this, continue with this conversation with Dr. Jim Prescott, who is the former Director of Behavioral Development Research at the National Institute of Health. You are listening to Children Come First, WAAT 750 AM on your radio dial. We are here every Tuesday from 10 to 11 a.m. This is Dr. Daria Brzezinski. We are talking about children and violence and how our child rearing practices in the United States have led to the kinds of violent behaviors you see at Columbine and the other shootings among our children. How the uh, fact that we separate our children both at birth and through our daycare practices and keep them isolated, how it affects our children with regard to their brain, the serotonin level, the tryptophan level, and how this leads to depression and the need for antidepressants of our children in the teenage years. We've been talking about breastfeeding and its importance, not merely just for the sake of bonding, but also the effects it has for children on their immune system and how important it is with regard to the children feeling safe in the nurturing environment. So there are many issues here that we are talking about. Dr. Prescott did a 20-year study on violence through the National Institute of Health, and we are going to be continuing talking with that on our broadcast through the rest of the next half hour. You can call us at 570-639-2931 if you would like additional information about our speaker today. Again, the number is 570-639-2931, or you can email us at prokids, P-R-O-K-I-D-S, at rlc.net, and we will be giving you the information about Dr. Prescott on our next half hour. Please come back and join us after our break, and we hear from our sponsors. go off on some of these tangents and getting a real bomb here but I don't I don't choose not to do that let's talk about the how how these cultures showed 
the peaceful cultures nurtured their children? In what way did that manifest? Well, it's, it's, it's basically, the, whether they... Everybody has a different definition of nurture. Well, uh, we have to distinguish what uh, was the criteria for the experiment versus the broader uh, characteristic of nurture, because they, uh, that single uh, variable of uh, carrying the infant in the body is highly correlated with a variety of other measures of, of, of nurture, such as if you don't punish your infant, that there's a, a very significant reciprocal relationship between whether or not uh, you're highly nurturing toward your infants and children, uh, respond immediately to the needs uh, uh, and discomfort as opposed to inflicting punishment and pain. Um, so that the cultures that are, are, are nurturing affection uh, tend not to uh, use uh, the pain and punishment as a form of, of uh, both discipline. I, I was amazed to read one of the um, cultures, and I can't remember which one it eludes me, as an African culture. The mothers and the children were so in tune and in sync with each other that the mother literally knew, it carried the child around all day long in a sack against her body and literally could feel when that child was about to defecate and remove the child from the sack and hold it out and it did its business and brought it back in again. I was just totally amazed at how in touch with their children and, and how they communicate in such nonverbal ways. It was astounding. Well, it's, it's in a way not surprising um, uh, when you examine what uh, the infant and child has just spent its first nine months is inside the body of a mother. You know, and you have this intimate body uh, contact. It's not only contact, but it's, you know, it's a part of the mother's body. And, uh, and so uh, at birth, uh, there is a separation. And the most critical thing is really to maintain that body contact continuity so that infant does not feel that it's been abandoned uh, by being you know, separated from the mother and placed in, in a crib that doesn't move. It's really that movement that really is, is the bridge uh, that maintains continuous uh, contact um, uh, and assurance to with the infant, you know, long before it can uh, uh, see or speak or understand language, that there is uh, a love relationship there. And that's, that's one of the things that we really need to emphasize, that, that uh, infants uh, know whether loved or not loved before they can even uh, uh, recognize their mother or father uh, uh, visually or auditorily uh, before they can understand language. So the language of love is, is, is really quite uh, special, although it follows the same rules as the acquisition of, of uh, the language of speech. And, and uh, that's, this is another important point to, to emphasize, that any newborn can learn any language in the world and speak it like a native, provided its developing brain is you know, exposed to the, the sounds of that language uh, during the formative periods of brain development for language acquisition. And just as that is true for speech, it's also true for language of love. And so once that period is gone, it's very difficult to, to learn the language of love uh, uh, and express it later in life. And now, were these countries that you studied modern countries? No, these are primitive cultures, pre-industrial cultures. That are, di that are here today? Uh, exist today? Well, I, I don't know how many are, are still uh, existing today, but the... Um, most of them probably are, but... Uh, what are the lessons that we can now learn from these uh, cultures? Well, basically, uh, we learned that uh, uh, we really need to, to uh, carry our uh, infants on, on the body of the mother through, throughout the day, uh, like these primitive cultures did. We need to adopt the practice of, of breastfeeding, that, uh, and at least the... Uh, consistent with the recommendation of the World Health Organization of, of two years uh, or longer. And uh, and not to be used as corporal punishment, physical punishment of, of children, you know, as a form of discipline. Um, so that, uh, and this is the most crucial uh, uh, and most relevant to, to uh, our current uh, situation here in, in the United States. In fact, we've got... Uh, two states that just recently passed laws making it lawful for parents uh, to physically, uh, you know, spank their children when it's Oklahoma and, uh, and, 
and I was waiting for the signature of the government. And um, so uh, these senators, uh, you know, they, they voted, uh, I've got the vote here up on the screen, that's uh, 96 to 4. What was the other state? Um, uh, let's see, the other state was... Uh, That's all right. Oh, no, it's, um, it's Oklahoma and... Um, um, what are these? Nevada. Nevada. These two states have, have just uh, uh, passed laws to, to permit uh, violence against uh, children in terms of thinking, you know? And uh, uh, so in the wake of what has happened in, in, uh, in Columbus, uh, uh, you know, it's just the the wrong reaction and the wrong... You mean Colorado? I mean Colorado. Um, and, um, uh, but also, uh, yeah, I'm thinking of something else. Yeah. And then we also have the situation in, in Georgia. So, um, Well, what I've done is I've done a little bit of research on the shooters in many of these instances, and ironically enough, uh, Ed Harris from Colorado happened to be on Zoloft which is an antidepressant. Mm -hmm. And many of the other shooters were all on antidepressants. Well, that is true. And, and uh, in fact, in a recent uh, uh, report on Time Magazine, uh, when they reviewed, I think, something like nine of these killers across uh, a number of different states. Yeah, I know. I sent it to Time Magazine. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, OK. They, uh, um, all of them have uh, major uh, emotional problems. They're all depressed. Many of them, most of them were on the antidepressants. And uh, so we have uh, that history that really needs to be fully developed, you know, uh, um, across the board, you know, and, and start examining just, you know, uh, how many of our depressed uh, adolescents uh, and, and how many of them are full of, of anger and rage and, and hostility, which is ready to blow up in, in, in violence. And, and that question is not being really addressed. Um, they talk about gun control, but all the gun control in the world isn't going to control or impact at all on, on the uh, depression and on the uh, anger and the rage and hostility that uh, these adolescents have. Besides? Oh, so the, my criticism is not that the gun control is not necessary, but it distracts uh, our society from really addressing the true causes of this violence and this depression. How can we help our children? I mean, you're talking about doing something to change the practices of pregnant, uh, birthing here, prenatal, postnatal, but we really aren't addressing, you really haven't said what we can do or can we do anything with regard to our children who are not birthed in this way? What kinds of things can we do? Do we keep giving them antidepressants? Well, uh, we have both a short-term and, and a long-term solution. and. Uh, I think mothers, uh, it's just not mothers, but uh, society at large now has to evaluate, you know, um, how we do business. I mean, there was uh, one time in this country that uh, the income of one adult was sufficient to raise a family of four. That's no longer the case. That's forcing mothers into the workplace at less than livable wages. And it's just compounding the situation and making it worse. And, uh, and we need to and, 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 and reassess what we're doing and supporting mothers to be nurturing mothers in the home. I and mean, we, I've yet to see a full cost accounting of this Child Welfare Reform Act. Uh, millions and millions of dollars are given to the states to, to provide training, you know, for the welfare mothers, for example. And uh, a lot of it uh, remains idle. And uh, it seems so much better sense to use this money to support mothers at home be nurturing mothers or bring them into um, parent-child uh, development centers uh, where there's no separation of, of the mother from the infant and the child and, and where they get training into and to par proper parenting skills uh, as opposed to the institutionalized daycare uh, situation. So uh, we do have a major problem and, and it's not going to be uh, easy to correct. Um, and it's getting worse under, under the uh, Willful Reform Act because then these mothers, after two years, they're stripped of all support. Um, and 
and there's no uh, network uh, uh, support network left uh, for them. If there was one thing that you could do to reduce violence, what would it be? Well, it would uh, support mothers being nurturing mothers, you know, and, and to support them, you know, uh, and, and breastfeeding for two years of age beyond, and also to be carrying their infants. We should provide these little uh, body carriers, you know, uh, so that the infant is carried continuously in the body of the mother throughout the day. Um, that is what the, uh, the scientific data uh, supports. And uh, this was a, a common child rearing practice in, in, in Japan, China, and many other countries until they become modernized, and also Africa. So, uh, I was going. I was going to ask you now to go back a little, take a few steps backwards, and uh, we've constructed deep and powerful defense structures that distort our perception, and these barriers are built into the nervous system. Um, how would you? How can we disarm ourselves with these bar from these barriers to cope? I'm with not sure exactly what your question is. Uh, so, to in order to protect our emotional sexual core, you were talking about the adolescent sexualities and predicting peace. Well, basically, we, uh, we're also teaching the wrong message with respect to, to sexuality. You know that uh, it's uh, sinful, it's dirty, it's you know, immoral. Rather, we ought to be uh, saying that uh, a sexuality is just too important. To, you know, uh, to be left hostage to the marriage state, and the marriage state is too important to be left hostage to the, the sexual state. But basically, we need to be teaching uh, the overriding importance of relationships. Uh, and that's where sexuality has its greatest meaning and greatest satisfaction. So that... Uh, well, there's so many ta taboos on sexuality, it's hard to, to differentiate between the myth and the reality. Well, that's, that's one of our, uh, our major problems. You know, so you combine a sexually puritanical uh, ethic with uh, one that uh, supports uh, the use of uh, punitive methods of, uh, of child grain and the deprivation of physical affection and pleasure, um, it wrecks havoc with the developing brain nervous system and, and obviously the, the, the behavior of the child, the adolescent and the adult. And we do have to remember that every adult uh, uh, was at one time a teenager and was at one time a, a child and an infant. And, um, so we're just, uh, you know, uh, we have to keep that developmental per perspective. Um, and, and I would like to point out, you know, that with all this concern about youth violence, that in fact the adult violence is much greater than the youth violence. And um, What do you mean? Well, it's just that uh, uh, this has to do with uh, debatable data, and it was been summarized by Mike Malice in The Escapable Generation, in the book, uh, called American War and Adolescence, and published in 1996. And he's uh, simply documented, and others have, you know, that in, in fact uh, uh, we are being misinformed that there is an epidemic of, of teenage violence. When, when there isn't. The adult violence is much greater. Let me, let me uh, report. This came out through, uh, uh, reported by the Christian Science Monitor, uh, when they uh, point out one of the, some of the findings of, of, of analysis in the book. And, um, is that uh, uh, three quarters of the babies born to teenagers are followed by adult men, that 90% of the children under age 12 and 60% of the teens ages 12 to 17 who are killed in this country are killed by adults. And it, nobody rails against the widespread grown-up pathology. Um, so when one looks at these kinds of statistics, the, our problem is with adults. Uh, I think what they're we, the ones that create the problems in our infants and children and youth. You're listening to Children Come First. This is WAAT 750 AM on your dial. This is Dr. Brzezinski, and we have been here for the last 45 minutes or so speaking with Dr. Jim Prescott, former Director of Behavioral Development Research at the National Institute of Health, and we're talking about violence in our children and our practices in America on the birthing of our children and the caring of rearing of our children and how it leads to violence among our children. The devastating consequences. I've heard you speak in the past before about allowing women the uh, ability to be able to control their own bodies. Can you speak a little bit about that? Well, this, this is a, 
uh, central to all of this. So, uh, when one looks at um, beyond the, the child grooming practices and, and, and uh, sexual practices, uh, this obviously is defined by the philosophical and moral assumptions that a culture makes. And, uh, and so, and, and that means, you know, the role of a woman and her sexuality. And that's why there is such uh, gender inequality uh, throughout the world. And uh, it's a consequence, in my view, of the patriarchal theistic cultures, which uh, continually uh, uh, troll and, and dominate uh, essentially uh, a woman, her, her body, and, uh, and certainly the expression of her sexuality. Um, so I'm, you know, uh, fully supportive of uh, gender equality uh, uh, legislation uh, that would truly uh, give equality to, to women with men. And, uh, uh, That's go not going to happen since we have so many legislators who are males and so few who are females and basically the male population has dominated our culture and our uh, value system and our rules and everything else that happens in our society. How can we possibly change that mentality? Well, we can, but uh, so, you know, this is a drum that I've been beating for a number of years, and, and nobody wants to listen to this one also. And uh, and that is um, a proposal that 50% um, of the uh, Senate and, and the House of Representatives and other and, and the state legislators uh, be men and women. And, and the Senate, that's that's very easy. There's two senators from each state, so one senator is a male, one senator is a female. And everyone votes, uh, obviously, for, for both of the candidates. Uh, in the House, it's a little bit more difficult, uh, but the easiest solution is just to double the number of representatives in, in the House of Representatives. So you have a male and female representing each district, so you don't have to do any redistricting. Uh, and this would make a profound change uh, in, in our nation, in our uh, uh, national laws, uh, where 50% of the elected representatives uh, are male and 50% are female. And I just simply want to emphasize that the uh, 19th Amendment, the equal right to vote, does not translate into equal right of representation. And so that, that is the unfinished agenda, and, and uh, I'm hoping that there will be some a party that will come forward and, and uh, make that initiative. Um, that's, you know, one of the uh, objectives that, that can be pursued at the national political level to bring about uh, gender equality representation. But that's not going to be, uh, immediately, you know, uh, uh, impact on some of these more fundamental issues of, of what, what is moral and what is immoral. Um, we have this whole philosophical and theistic uh, world view that uh, pleasure and sexual pleasure is sinful and immoral um, and at its very core. And that uh, sexual, sexual art can only be uh, legitimized within a very state. And that's just plain wrong. I mean, the, uh, uh, a human uh, person, you know, engaged in sexual relationships uh, uh, extremely more often than just was required to, to uh, produce a, a child or two, which is the average time in our family. Now, let's get to reality and nitty gritties here. You said that uh, basically the possible lesson for our culture is that these breakdowns and effectual bonding reflect uh, in everything from our divorce rate to crimes to alcoholism, drug abuse, etc. And you're asking us for mothers to stay home with their children or at least be close to their children and daycare perhaps is not the answer. In our modern society today where two parents have to work in order to keep up with the Joneses, what would, you, what would be the suggestion to those mothers who feel they must work in, and actually you're perception of mothers is is accurate being a woman and having been a single mother I can tell you that a woman who stays home with her children is not regarded very highly especially at parties where you when someone asks you what you do when you say I'm a mother who stays home I mean that's not something that anybody wants to talk about how can we elevate the status of a woman number one to be in any parent who stays home and raises their children how can we uh, do something to elevate that status and or what can we do to mothers who do go to work and how can we help them? Well, um, that's a complex question or the more complex of answers or attempted solutions. Um, 
I think you well described just uh, how impossible our culture is to raise uh, any other child with affection and nur- nurture and, and bond- bonding. Uh, we have uh, very few bonded children, and, and that means very few bonded uh, adolescents and bonded adults. And that impacts, uh, let me follow this train of thought, that impacts on the stability of the male-female relationship as, a, as an adult. Because uh, when that infant does not bond with its mother, um, it's certainly not going to bond with uh, anyone else. Uh, and that's certainly true in the daycare, which is uh, uh, run by strangers. Uh, there's a high turnover rate. It's impossible for the infant child to bond with anyone in the daycare center. There's no bond with the mother, and it usually it hasn't really bonded with the father, although there's some changes in terms of recognition of the force of the father in bonding. Uh, and so you have essentially an unbonded child. And then we wonder why uh, these kids grow up to be depressed and, and uh, seeking drugs for self-medication for their the emotional pain of, of loss of human love, you know. And um, um, that's, that's uh, you know, our history. And then, then we come back with the kinds of uh, laws that criminalize uh, drug use, which uh, is an attempt to deal with uh, a history of loss of human love. Um, rather than dealing with the specifics of, of uh, crime that's associated with drug use and punishing the crimes and not the, not the drug use itself. And uh, we learned that with, with alcohol. You know, the prohibition of alcohol did, did not work. And we made criminals out of people who just consumed alcohol. Um, and we haven't learned from that history. Uh, so we need a drastic revolution, really, in how we're dealing with the, uh, drug use and the com- consumption in this country. Uh, the recognition of what drives this, and uh, and also that the massive consumerism is, is uh, another reflection of this loss of human love because we try to fill the void with, with material objects, and, and uh, you never can. And so there's a compulsion uh, of this chronic stimulus-seeking behavior again, which is like to the manifest in, in consumption behavior. And, but it's really not getting to the emotional core of relationship, and, and that's what we really have to emphasize you know, uh, throughout uh, human development, and uh, beginning with uh, the mother, the father, uh, the school system, the community, and, uh, and as adolescents develop sexual relationships, uh, it's uh, to emphasize the absolute necessity of relationship, you know, and uh, that will put a, a major uh, break on casual sex and, and, uh, and, and irresponsible sex. So. Uh, uh, there are things that uh, we need to do, but uh, our national policy really is uh, almost at all levels uh, geared against this. And uh, so. Uh, well, I thank you for everything you've given us today. You certainly have given us a lot of food for thought. This has been Dr. Jim Prescott. You can reach him email wise at D. P R E S C O L at S A N dot R R dot C O M. That's Dr. Jim Prescott at D P R E S C O L at S A N dot R R dot C O M, where you can find out about his website. One correction that L is a one. Number I'm one. sorry, D. Oh, no wonder I can't ever reach it. Presco one. uh, D-P-R-E-S-C-O-1 at S-A-N dot R-R dot com. Sorry about that. Uh, He has a website, www.violence.de, and you can reach us here if you'd like any information about Dr. Prescott or anyone else who's been on our program. We are 570-639-2931. Our email is prokids, P-R-O-K-I-D-S, at rlc.net. That number again is 570-639-2931. Our number and web email is prokids, P-R-O-K-I-D-S, at rlc.net. This is Children Come First, and this is Dr. Daria Brzezinski. Dr. Prescott, thank you so much for having uh, been a guest today and for giving up your time of day today for, to be with us out, out there in California. Well, I, I appreciate very much uh, you having me, and I hope uh, this information will prove helpful to your listeners, and, and uh, I want to thank you very much.
Thank you so much, and please join us again next week on 7.50 a.m. Children Come First, WAAT AM, 7.50 a.m. on your radio dial. We'll be back with you next Tuesday from 10 to 11 a.m. Thank you so much, and have a wonderful day, and hug those children.